Kevin was recklessly driving his truck on the icy highway as snow was blowing around. The dangerous weather had kept most people inside, but a handful of brave drivers ventured out nonetheless. Kevin watched as the occasional car zoomed by, becoming obscured by the heavy snowfall. Sighing contentedly, he glanced at a photograph of his wife Laura which was hung up on his rearview mirror. The festive season was coming nearer and he couldn't wait to go back home to spend it with her. He had been away on a long journey for almost two months and was now returning home with a surprise for his precious spouse. Reaching into the glove compartment, he pulled out a small box and opened it to reveal the gold necklace he had bought for Laura, a smile spread across his face in satisfaction. On a snow-covered Christmas night, Kevin tucked away a shining box in his glove compartment and sped up the truck with an exhaust of smoke. He headed for the city, with glistening decorations in the background. Kevin pulled into the truck stop and then decided to take a stroll home from there. He let go of the truck and carried on his journey on foot. As he went down the generally recognizable streets, it was hard to overlook how much had changed. When he left his job in the fall, everyone felt downcast and irritable, yet now even with the overcast atmosphere people were more optimistic. Despite the cold winter air and snow piling up, everyone seemed to be in good spirits as they gazed in awe at the holiday decorations adorning storefront windows, including mistletoe, just like children. As he reached home, Kevin greeted the neighbors who were coming and going. He even helped a young mother carry her baby carriage up to the third floor. Finally, he reached the door of his apartment and pressed adorable a few times before hiding behind the wall. Eager to surprise Laura, he eagerly anticipated her reaction, rubbing his hands together in excitement. But as time passed, no one came to the door. Leaving Kevin confused and perplexed and frowning. Kevin dogged through his pocket for his keys and unlocked the door himself. Hello. Is anyone home? He called out as he walked into dark hallway. I'm home, surprise my love, but there was only silence in response without taking off his shoes. Kevin made his way through the living room, kitchen and bedroom, but there was no one there. Dust was settled everywhere, indicating that Laura had not been home for quite some time, possibly a week or. Kevin grew increasingly worried and took out his phone to call his wife, but it was dead frustrated. He tossed the phone aside and ran to the landline phone on the table where he found a note next to it. I'm sorry it didn't work out. He read the note written by his wife's hand. I realized I deserve more. I met someone else and have found happiness. I wish you the same. Kevin repeated the last word to himself several times before. Crumpling up the paper and throwing it against the wall in anger. What does it even mean? He asked himself out loud as he sat down on the couch. There was no answer. Only Laura who was, God knows where, knew the answer to Kevin's question. After her, only a few things were left in the apartment and the lingering scent of her perfume from the after some thoughts, Kevin decided to go to Laura's work, a fast food restaurant where they had met two years ago. Back then, Laura had just started working there. Having recently moved to the city from a small town. She was still getting used to the city and relied on the GPS to get around. It was Kevin who showed her the ropes and helped her navigate the city. They fell in love, got married, and planned to live happily ever after. But now all that was left of their life together was the crumpled note under the. Kevin quickly got dressed and left his apartment. When he arrived at the restaurant by taxi, he saw Laura getting into a red BMW, the door being held open for her by a well-dressed man from his large build and bald head. Kevin recognized him as Laura's boss, Sean. He was not a particularly likable person with various rumors circulating about. Some said he had been involved in drug trafficking in the past. Others believed he was part of a large criminal organization and had used his ill-gotten gains to open several restaurants after leaving that life behind. Sean was not well respected in the city despite the fact that many people both respected and feared him due to his wealth and connections, but that didn't matter at the moment. 
what was important was the kind of person Laura had chosen to leave her honest and decent husband. After a moment of hesitation, Kevin ran towards the car, but it was too late. The BMW drove away, leaving Kevin standing in the dirty snow as it disappeared down an alley, taking his wife with it, cursing. Kevin walked away, pulling his hat over his ears and pulling up his hood. He walked quickly down the sidewalk, pushing past the people in his way. He spent several days drinking his mind, caught between dreams and... Sometimes it felt like the front door of the apartment was opening and Kevin would hurry to the hallway, but when he saw that no one was there, he would sink to the floor in disappointment and hit it with his fist. He even thought he saw Laura looking in through the window, smiling at him, which caused him almost fall from the fourth floor as he climbed up on the window windowsill to open the... It's unclear how long he would have continued drinking if it weren't for his elderly neighbor downstairs who had grown tired of all the noise and came to check on Kevin. Oh, it's you, Mr. Feist, Kevin yawned as he opened the door for his neighbor. What are you doing up this early? Kevin asked as Mr. Feist looked at his watch and saw that it was 3.20 on Christmas morning. Well, I came to wish you a Merry Christmas. He said as he nonchalantly walked into the A. I see you've been celebrating for a while now. He observed looking at the bottles littered in the living room. I'm tired of this. I don't feel like celebrating, maybe more like mourning. He continued as he let Mr. Foz into the living room. My wife left me, and I've been drinking care to join Mr. Feist. Kevin offered handing him a glass of whiskey as the neighbor drank. Kevin sat down on the couch and began telling him the chaotic story of how he and Laura broke up and what she wrote in her note without any expectation of getting an answer. Kevin asked Mr. Faiz, was I making good money? Hell yeah. I was not as much as her new boyfriend, but not too bad either. Did I take her to Spain? I sure did. Gifts tons. I don't know, man. Maybe I did miss something after all. I gave her everything she needed. Or maybe it's because I'm an orphan. Sure. I grew up in an orphanage with no parents, but that's not my fault. Mr. Fies took another glass of whiskey and wiped his mouth with his hand. That's not it. Dear Kevin, he replied softly shaking his head. There are fickle women. They swear eternal love to you today and tomorrow they'll find someone better and that. There are men like that too. A friend of mine was abandoned by his wife and immediately found a new one, and you won't believe it. He dumped her later. Why? For no reason. He said he took revenge, but on who? Only on himself. Now he's also drinking and feeling sorry for himself. People are sure. Strange creatures. Mr. Fies waited for a moment. Looking at Kevin. I don't know what to do. Kevin suddenly spoke up his stone. I loved Laura and she did this to me. Why should I live now? What's the point of living anymore? Well, you can just live for no particular reason. The neighbor replied, she wasn't the one for you. If she left you, why agree for her? You should be glad that such a burden has been lifted from your shoulders. It's like if you were drowning and she didn't reach out to help you, would you still love her? After that, God gave this wonderful gift. Life. Enjoy. Kevin admitted that the old man was right and sighed heavily. I'm sorry for causing you so much trouble. Kevin said, feeling that he was sobering up a little. I won't be here tonight. I'm leaving town so I won't bother you. On Christmas Eve, Kevin found his clothes in a pile and quickly put them on. He went to the bathroom to clean up the conversation with his neighbor. Had a better effect on him than any medicine, and Kevin no longer felt a heavy hangover. Mr. F.Y. sat for a little longer than got up and headed through the Merry Christmas. He called out to Kevin, who had closed himself in the bathroom. Merry Christmas. Kevin called back from behind the door and then quietly added. I don't know how merry it will be. We'll see. 
On Christmas Eve when families gathered in their cozy homes and raised glasses, Kevin was driving through the snowy highway on a truck. He was so eager to get away from everything that had happened to him over the past week that he didn't pay attention to the ice and heavy snow. The road was empty again. No one wanted to rush anywhere on this magical night, and only Kevin was in a hurry to get somewhere, turning the steering wheel to the right and left and looking in the mirror at the fireworks, flying up into the to distract himself. He turned on the music and turned up the volume. The festive songs slightly lifted his spirits. He wished himself a Merry Christmas and took a sip from a box of grape juice to the left. A bright firework shot up from behind the wall of the forest. Apparently, someone was celebrating Christmas in nature. Kevin considered this an answer to his congratulations and smiled fireworks reminded him of his joyless and difficult childhood, but it was still a C. Kevin used to love Christmas very much and looked forward to it every year. Now things were a little different as he slowed down and wished the people behind the forest. A happy holiday, he hit the gas again and soon got lost in the endless snowfall. Kevin returned from a strip two weeks later when the holiday was already completely over on an early January morning. His truck was slowly but surely moving towards the city, following the stream of cars. Everything was as usual, but suddenly glancing at the dashboard, he noticed that the fuel was running long. Fortunately, a road sign that had warned of a nearby gas station who was only half a mile away breathing a sigh of relief. Kevin looked for the gas station among the trees and turned left just in time, as the fuel in the tank was almost completely gone. After getting out of the truck and opening the gas tank, Kevin ran to the building to pay for the fuel in warm-up at the same. As he reached the door, it swung open abruptly and an alarmed man and only a t-shirt jumped out. It appeared to be the cashier, sir. Glad you came in. The man exclaimed to Kevin as he entered the room. Kevin, who had been hit by the door, was now rubbing his forehead. I need assistance. The man said, Kevin, glare at him and put his hat back on his head. You nearly knocked my head off and now you want help. Kevin said Sark. What's going on? The cashier signaled for the guy to come inside. As soon as Kevin entered the room, he saw a young woman lying on the floor, holding her stomach and screaming in pain. What the heck is she having a baby? Kevin recoiled in shock. Why haven't you called an ambulance? The cashier responded. I already did. They said they're underway, but the highway is blocked. They might be stuck. Listen, do you think you can take her to the hospital? Can you make it? Kevin quickly looked at the cashier and nodded, I'll take her to the hospital, but I need at least 20 gallons of diesel. He said, with a sense of urgency in his voice. Hurry up. Now. The cashier quickly got to work pumping diesel into Kevin's truck while Kevin picked up the woman and carried her to the. Once the truck was refueled, Kevin climbed into the driver's seat, and as soon as he did, the woman sitting in the passenger seat contorted in pain, turned to him and exclaimed in. Surprised John, you're alive. Kevin shrugged his shoulders and assumed that the woman was confused and delirious. He quickly started the truck and began driving to the hospital. The truck quickly made its way back onto the road. Its engine roaring as it rushed. After just a few minutes of driving the truck, entered the city and pulled up to the nearest hospital. Kevin handed the woman over to the care of the doctors and promised to come back and check on her as he drove back home, he couldn't stop thinking about the way the woman looked at him as he drove her to the hospital. There was no mistaking the recognition in her eyes. The woman, despite her pain, was clearly certain that she recognized. This realization frightened him as he couldn't understand why she would know him or how she would recognize him. Kevin couldn't sleep and got up at midnight. He went to visit his neighbor, Mr. Fies, who also couldn't sleep since the passing of his wife. The old man lived alone and often stayed up late reading newspapers and reminiscing. Kevin went to visit him and over a cup of coffee, told him about how he had helped a pregnant stranger. You should definitely go see her. 
Mr. F.Y. is said to Kevin, looking at him serious. You never know. It might be important. After finishing his coffee and playing a game of chess with his neighbor, Kevin went to bed the next morning, he returned to the hospital. A nurse was already there waiting for him, and upon seeing him, she greeted him with a big smile and gestured X excitedly with her hands. Why didn't you tell us you were the father? Right away the nurse explained, making Kevin step back, they just think it would be funny to play a prank. Kevin asked her carefully what she meant and the nurse couldn't help but laugh. You're asking me. She wrestled through some papers and said, your wife said she saw her husband bring her to the hospital. You're her husband, aren't you? Kevin just shrugged his shoulders and sat down at the table looking exhausted. He didn't argue and just looked tiredly at the nurse. Can I see her? He asked rubbing his frost-burned face and frustra. I just need to ask her something. Not right now. Christine is resting. She lost a lot of blood during childbirth and was transferred to intensive care. Come back in three days and you can talk to her then. Then there smiled again and looked at Kevin with a playful expression. Don't worry, you'll get to see your child. It's a cute boy, by the way. He's currently under observation, but that's normal. The doctor said he's doing well. The nurse reassured. Kevin wiped the sweat off his forehead and nodded so her name is Christine. He said to himself, well, it's time for you to leave. The nurse laughed again. You're a strange man, just like my ex. She called out to Kevin as he left. Three days later, Kevin was finally allowed to see Christine when he met her near the ward. He didn't know how to start the conversation for a while, and Christine just sat there with her eyes wide open and surprised and couldn't say. After a moment of silence, Christine suddenly exclaimed, Oh, John, and hugged him tightly. John, darling Kevin gently patted her on the back and helped her sit down in the chair, then sat down beside her. I'm sorry, but I don't know who John is. My name is Kevin. I don't know you and you don't know me. We met four days ago and I brought you here to give birth. He said, and to prove it, he took out his driver's license from his pocket and showed it to Christ. Seeing it. Christine shook and burst into tears, but I had hoped John would still be alive. She cried that she leaned on. Kevin, you resemble him so much. I thought it was a Christmas miracle. I have been waiting for it. And now, after Christine had calmed down, Kevin asked her what had happened to her husband, John Christine requested some water, and once Kevin had fulfilled her request, she began to share her story. It turned out that Christine's husband John, bought a resemblance to Kevin. He had passed away three months ago in October. John had been an entrepreneur and ran his own car service business. Everything was fine until Christine's husband, John's army friend. Mark re-entered their lives. Mark has spent time in prison for a fatal brawl and faced difficulty finding employment after his release, in an effort to help his friend, John decided to hire him as a mechanic at his car. However, after working for some time, Mark realized that he did not enjoy the life of a simple laborer and wanted John to make him the manager. John refused, and this led to Mark harboring resentment towards John Christine's face twisted in pain as she remembered these events. Of course, Mark didn't reveal his true feelings and always kept up a friendly facade, but one day he invited John to spend the weekend. Christine was against it, but John believed that Mark wouldn't do anything to harm him and went anyway, later Christine found out that John had drowned. Mark claimed that he fell out of the boat and got tangled in the fishing gear and that he was unable to save him. Naturally, everyone believed Mark's story because there were no witnesses. It's not surprising there were no witnesses in the middle of the river on an early October morning, but Christine believed that John couldn't have drowned so. He was a very good swimmer and always wore a life vest. Christine broke down in tears again, and Kevin poured her more water. I'm sorry, Kevin said lowering his head. I'm sorry for your loss and for the way things have turned out. By the way, 
how did you end up at the gas station without your coat? Christine, why away her tears and swallowed the lump in her throat before answering Kevin's question. Quietly after John's death, Mark often came to visit. He persuaded me to marry him, promising that he would help me raise my child. Of course, I refused him and asked him to leave, but he kept coming back again and again. I couldn't do anything to stop him. Then I started not opening the door for him, and then one day as I was returning from the store, Mark caught me and dragged me into his car and drove me out of town in the woods. The car broke down and I tried to escape. Mark grabbed my jacket and I struggled, and the jacket remained in his. I don't remember what happened after that. It seems I ran somewhere and then fell, and I only woke up in your truck. Kevin nodded satisfied that everything finally made sense to him. He got up, said goodbye to Christine and walked down the corridor towards the stairs. But as he was about to leave, Christine suddenly called out to him and Kevin stopped. When I'm discharged, could you take me home? I have no one else to ask Christine. Of course, I'll pick you up. He said quickly writing down his phone number on a piece of paper. Here. Call me when you're discharged. I'll come right away. Christine accepted the paper with trembling fingers and hid it in the pocket of her dressing gown. Thank you. She whispered. Looking directly into Kevin's eyes, I will be waiting for you. Kevin. Silently turned and locked down the corridor. His body trembling as if from extreme. The next day, Kevin went to the place where he spent his childhood to find out if he had a twin brother. The orphanage where Kevin grew up had not changed at all. The walls were still painted green and adorned with depictions of superheroes, the same noisy hallways and the same sad faces of children in whose eyes a barely perceptible hope flickered. Kevin greeted a couple of familiar teachers and went into the office of the head. A woman named Sally O.L. He immediately explained the reason for his visit and didn't forget to mention John. After listening to him, Mrs. Olson's expression changed and she quickly walked over to the window. Then she confessed to him that he had not ended up in the orphanage alone. There were two of you still tiny little babies. He was really cold that day. She said, without looking at Kevin, those were hard times. There were too many, refused and found babies, and we constantly ran out of bed. We made the decision to keep you with us and gave your brother to a childless couple. I remember when they took your brother, you cried a lot. We all tried to comfort you. Three years later, we found out the couple who adopted, your brother got divorced. They abandoned their adopted son, and your brother was sent to another orphanage. And then we had a lot of orphans and not a single available bed. That's how faith separated you both. I'm really sorry it happened. We should have told you about everything. Kevin grabbed his head. The weight of the revelation hit him hard. If only I knew I had a brother, all of this could have been avoided. John would have been alive, and his wife would have been happy, and now she's alone. Why did it all turn out like this? Kevin asked. Overwhelmed with emotion. Mrs. Olson shrugged her shoulders and leaned on the windowsill again, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know. She whispered. I guess there are things we can't. Kevin gritted his teeth got up and quickly left her office. It was unbearable for him to be in the orphanage, and when he stepped out into the street, he felt as if he had climbed out into fresh air from a collapsed mine. He walked all the way home, constantly checking his phone and waiting for Christine's call but there was no call. The long-awaited call finally came the next morning. Christine informed Kevin that she was being discharged and asked him to pick her up. Kevin quickly took a taxi and rushed to the. Christine was already waiting outside with her son in her arms. Kevin looked into the bundle and smiled when he saw the baby's round face. He tickled the baby's nose with his finger and then ordered Christine to get into the car and they went home. Christine's apartment was located in the city center next to her husband's car service. Mark had somehow managed to forge documents and now he owned everything that John had spent years. 
Christine sadly looked out the window at the car service building as they drove by and closed their eyes. Kevin, noticing this gently touched her hand. They reached the apartment building and got out of the taxi. Kevin paid the fare and they headed inside. It's him. Christine whispered, pointing in the direction of Mark Kevin squinted and covered his face from the sun. Seeing a dark figure in the. Mark was tall and thin, resembling a skeleton and looked like ominous in his long black cloak and dark glasses. Mark also saw Christine and waved at her. Kevin quickly turned away so Mark wouldn't see his face. Christine holding her son tightly to her chest, grabbed Kevin's hand and pulled him to the door, practically running up to stairs. Christine quickly unlocked a door to her apartment and Kevin found himself in a small hallway that resembled his. He sat on the living room sofa and looked around. Soon his eyes fell on a photograph on the chest of drawers with a black ribbon at the corner. When Kevin saw the face in the picture, he covered his mouth with his hand and started sobbing. It was a picture of his twin brother who looked exactly like him. It felt like he was looking in the mirror. His styled black hair, brown eyes, curved lips, barely visible. John was his exact copy, a perfect and incredible replication. It's not surprising that Christine mistook him for her husband. If Kevin had not known about everything in advance, he would have thought he had gone mad. Suddenly there was a knock at the door. Christine looked into Peep Hall and was frightened recoiling. She looked at Kevin, who had come up to her. By this time, it's Mark, she whispered. He won't leave me. What should I, Kevin asked her to go to her son's room. Then he took out his phone from his pocket and turned on the recorder. Kevin opened the door and greeted Mark with a smile and asked what he needed. Mark turned pale and backed away, almost falling over the railing. You're supposed to be dead. He screamed. Trying not to look at Kevin. How did you get out? I what drowned me. Kevin finished. I threw you out of the boat. Mark shook his head and cringed like a bursting balloon. I killed you. You're, you're dead. He shouted, choking on his own words. I, I killed you. How did you get back? Kevin grabbed him by the collar and pulled him closely and hit him really hard across the face with a strong hook. I came back for you, Kevin snarled in Mark's. Do you think? I didn't know what you were doing all this time. He roughly pushed Mark against the railing, causing him to tremble with fear and weep like a child. Then Mark collapsed to the floor in the entrance and Kevin said, there you go. You've admitted to everything. Why didn't you just do that from the start? It would have been easier for both of us, wouldn't it? Don't you feel relieved? And your life will be much easier now, especially since you're familiar with. Leaving Mark lying on the ground, Kevin walked out and called the police. When they arrived, he handed them his phone with the recording of Mark's confession. Mark, who had now regained his composure, told the police in detail about how he believed he had killed John. But it's time you should find out that I'm not really John. Kevin smiled as the police let Mark out of the building. I'm actually his twin brother. Mark's face turned red with anger and he stormed like a mad. I, I didn't kill anyone. He shouted as he launched forward. I was just joking. I'm insane. I'm just talking nonsense. One of the officers took hold of Mark's shoulder and kept him in place. You will have the opportunity to explain everything at the station. Sir, let's go. As the door closed behind the police and Mark Christine, who had come out to investigate the commotion, asked T.E. what had occurred. Kevin told her this whole story and she couldn't help but burst into tears. The investigation into Mark's case took several months with the main issue being that investigators could not find any witnesses who saw Mark pushing John overboard. This caused delays in the process and threatened the fairness of the trial justice as Mark was about to be released. Due to lack of evidence. Kevin, who had been conducting his own investigation found two witnesses. 
There were two elderly fishermen who also happened to be on the river that fateful morning and saw Mark disposing of the body. Thanks to their testimony, the court gave Mark a harsh sentence of 12 years in federal prison. During the announcement of the verdict, Christine held Kevin's hand tightly. As they sat together, she let out a sigh of relief when she learned that Mark would be spending a significant amount of time in prison. Mark's going to get locked up. I can't believe it's. Now we need to figure out what to do with the car service. I don't want it to fail and shut down, but I have no clue how to manage it. Do you think you can help me? She directed the question towards Kevin, making him feel compelled to say yes. Sure, he smiled. I'll handle it. I've been wanting to change careers for a while. I guess I was just waiting for the right opportunity. Christine smiled and then subtly pulled Kevin close kissing him. Kevin didn't hesitate and responded with an even more passionate kiss. They held each other tightly for around 10 minutes, disregarding the cold, rain and gusty wind, and shared heated kisses. Half a year gone by and it was time to get ready for Christmas once again, this included decorating the Christmas tree, buying gifts and making wishes. Kevin and Christine had been married for three months, and they lived in both Christine's apartment and Kevin's place. However, they had decided to spend Christmas somewhere different and chose to celebrate it at their old neighbor, Mr. On Christmas evening, Faye was overjoyed to receive a visit at his apartment by Christine and her son Alex. Little Alex was having fun playing with tinsel, bringing happiness to Mr. Faye's. The elderly gentleman was so overcome with emotion that Kevin had to divert his attention by offering him a bottle of something to open. Here's to all the wonderful memories we've shared and will share in the future. Kevin's elderly neighbor bellowed joyfully as the festive feast was being prepared. It instantly reminded him of the events that had taken place exactly one year ago. He rose to his feet and beamed at his old friend. He looked at his glass of champagne and remarked, Without you, I would have been drinking away my life. None of this would have happened if it weren't for you. Losing my job and not having the chance to meet Christine was a difficult time for me. I'm extremely grateful to you for helping me through it. A year ago I raised a glass in your honor, Mr. Feist, and Kevin's face filled with joy at that moment. Speaking softly, he expressed his joy to everyone present. Simultaneously, they all raised their glasses in anticipation of what the upcoming Christmas would bring. Despite their uncertainty, no one was without faith that the following